Hey again YouTube. This one's taken me a little longer than I'd hoped to put together. I was working on things for the video as I was endlessly fiddling with the software and fickle dependencies. As soon as I would document something, it would change, or some massive development would happen and render a bunch of instructions confusing or software breaking. Well, after about a week or so, I think things have settled down enough that you may be able to do things in a way they could potentially be repeated by more than just a handful of people with specific hardware and a specific setup. Now, when it comes to hardware, I think most of this really applies to NVIDIA cards only. I don't think Stable Diffusion works on AMD cards yet, but uh, I guess that could change. I'm only vaguely familiar with CUDA, and AMD users will have to rely on Google's blazingly fast supercomputers on Colab. Tragic. But there is an option out there to run the models on CPU now, which sounds like it'll work for most people in a pinch, but it is the slowest of all options. It sounds like even on a high-end CPU, it'll take about 2-3 to three minutes to generate a decent 512x512 512 512 Im image. A brief word of warning, this software is going to heavily stress your GPU. If you have fan trouble or have modded your card with some stupid weird fan curve, probably fix that before using it and think about your life choices. You have more important things to be doing in life than generating a CGI boba. Head over to Tech Power Up and grab a copy of GPU-Z if you don't have it already. You're going to want to keep watch of your GPU temperature so you don't run into weird thermal throttling issues, and this little program will also help you watch your GPU RAM usage, which can help you maximize your image and batch size later. Since the release of Stable Diffusion, development on the inference scripts and the interface has been pretty brisk. Early on, a developer named Bazo Jindal had the idea to load the model in chunks rather than onto the GPU all at once. That really opened up the higher resolution image inferences, the 512 by 512 to a lot of people, myself included. The official code base has been forked with several developers working on their own GUIs or hacking away at the original Gradio interface. I think the most advanced web UI is currently the HLKY fork, not actually sure how to pronounce the developer's name there. This fork also has a lot of other features, but many may only be available to those with over 8 gigabytes of RAM on their GPU. The web UI can feed images directly into GFP GAN for face feature correction and into real ESR GAN for image upscaling. For those with less than 8 gigabytes of GPU RAM, I'll go over the standalone Python real ESR GAN scripts with the integrated GFP GAN, which can be used outside of stable diffusion for face correction and upscaling. If you're not familiar with any of those words, and they all sound like gibberish, it's fine. Just follow along and you'll get this stuff working. This fork also incorporates a few new samplers. The diffusion samplers may end up running a lot faster and giving better results with fewer sampling steps, but you'll have to give them a shot on your own hardware to really find out. I'll show some images generated with various samplers, rates, and CFG values shortly. As for the installation, I think the installation for Stable Diffusion is best explained in written form. Things like command line flags and URLs are really cumbersome to speak, so I want to direct you to what is more or less the definitive guide over at reentry.org. The link to what has been so lovingly titled as the Ultimate GUI Retard Guide is down below in the description. Both the Linux and Windows guides include scripts that will handle the entire download and setup process, as long as you've installed Conda. And if you follow either of those guides, you should be able to get things running. For those using GTX 1600 series cards, you need to edit the relauncher.py file located in the script subdirectory to get things running. So for those with less than 8GB of memory on the GPU, you'll need to load the model in optimized mode. If you have 6GB of GPU memory, you can probably use the optimized turbo flag, which runs a little bit faster, but uses a little bit more memory. If you have a 1600 series GPU, you'll also need to use the no half flag, or the model will split out data type errors. And you'll also need to use the precision full option, or your output will be a bunch of green error PNGs. In addition, for those with 1600 series cards, you won't be able to use the integrated real ESR GAN and GFP GAN model support in the web UI so don't put the model files in the directories when following the tutorials. The same is probably true for anyone else without an 8GB GPU, because the models will just be too large to load. I'll go over the standalone version of real ESR GAN after poking around the Stable Diffusion web UI. After specifying the command line options in the script, the web UI can be started by running python scripts slash relauncher.py from the root directory of Stable Diffusion. 
the script runs the web UI and, and relaunches the backend if it crashes. Later, to quit, hit Ctrl C a bunch of times to terminate the script. The first time Stable Diffusion is launched, it will download a bunch of models and associated files. This will take a while depending on your connection speed, but it's a one time thing. Load up the web UI by going to the URL shown in the console window. As it stands, the current Gradio web UI is pretty usable as long as you aren't right on the edge of running out of GPU memory. And being on Gradio means you can access it remotely, so there's that. Use the sliders on the left to specify the output resolution. 512 by 512 pixels seems small, but you can use machine learning later to upscale it. You can go larger, but you may get lower quality or less relevant output, maybe. Shrinking one dimension while making the other dimension larger than 512 could generate some interesting output because the model was trained on some larger size images, especially if the subject that you're trying to generate is always in that aspect ratio, for example, a movie poster or a flag. Keeping track of the seed will allow you to regenerate the same image using the same prompt and the same sampler. And as it notes, the CFG slider controls how strictly the image needs to follow the prompt. The batch count is how many inference cycles will be run when you hit generate, and the batch size is how many images per batch will be generated. If you have the available GPU memory, increase the batch size for more efficient bulk image generation. The new samplers in this build dramatically improve the quality of output, especially when using low step counts. My GPU takes about 12 seconds to generate a 512x512 512 image using the Huon at 12 steps, and 10 seconds at about 20 steps using Euler both producing output quality good enough to skim through the images and see if there's anything worth keeping. There's a lot of work going into tools to make writing prompts easier, but for now I'd suggest trying to learn the weird gibberish you'll need to speak to effectively query this thing. There's an interesting site, lexica.art, that has a collection of user-generated images and associated prompts if you want to browse and attempt to try to recreate the images. I'll demo some more of the elaborate prompts later, but for now we'll just stick with Lucy. I'm going to keep the sampler, sampling rate, and prompt the same and run through the range of the CFG slider to show how it influences the images produced. A higher classifier free guidance level should make the samples adhere more to the prompt and produce higher quality output for the same seed and sampler. Trying to understand actually how the classifier free guidance level influences the output produced does my head in a bit. The math is too much for me, but I've included a link down below if you're interested in looking. Well. Beauty is an eye of the beholder, but the images seem to increase in complexity and adherence to my weird prompt, to a certain point. After some peak level, you'll probably notice the quality falling off. My guess is that this is dependent on the data set, with more common terms being able to have higher CFG values, produce better quality images, and adhere more to the topic. Keeping the sampling rate low will let you generate images quickly, and if you see something in the muddy output that looks like it may be interesting, you can regenerate it with a higher sampling rate by using the same seed. As you can see, toward the end of the slider, the output quality is fairly poor. The images are noisy and mostly nonsensical, but earlier, Stable Diffusion did generate some pretty stunning representations of Lucille Ball. Maybe not the flamingo hybrid racer tooth one, though? Let me go and generate an image that may be worth keeping, and then we can play with the samplers, sampling rate, and later take it over to image to image and really make a mess of things. To start off, I'll increase the height of the image to see if I can try to coax out a better quality portrait without needing to generate too many images. My 6GB GPU can only handle images up to about 576 by 512 or vice versa before running out of memory, but that's more than good enough to make some pretty pictures. Something bold and colorful and somewhat broken will make a good example for this, so let's stick with this one. It doesn't fit the prompt perfectly, but let's explore it a little to see what we can come up with. The image seed is found down below the fold, so I'll take that and put it into the box on the left hand side. To clean the image up, increase the sampling rate a little at a time, and then regenerate with the same sampler. Choosing a different diffusion sampler will produce radically different results, and different samplers operate at different speeds and require varying degrees of samples to produce good outputs. Increasing the sampling rate past a certain point will probably result in diminishing returns. Often very high sampling rates will produce a clear image, but one that differs a lot from the rest of the images in the set. As you can see, we go from a standing portrait to a head and shoulder shot at the upper bound of sampling. Strange things happen on the fringes. Let's go back and regenerate our three-legged Lucy. 
It's just more of a good thing, no? Maybe we can fix that in image to image. There we go. Glad our girl got back home whole. And then some. I was intending on packing everything into one video, but some software changes required re-recording. So instead, I'll get this posted now, and then if there's anything anyone wants to see in part 2, I can add that on to it as well. In part 2, I'll go over face correction with GFP GAN, upscaling with real ESR GAN, and image to image transformations with stable diffusion, along with anything from the comments section. Thanks for watching, and I'll be back soon.